Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. This time we're going to be talking about learning and what the ideal school of the future might include. Our guest is David Sorenda. Dr. Sorenda is the Dean of the Graduate School of Consciousness Studies at John F. Kennedy University in Orinda, which offers a master's degree in integrative education. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and the father of three daughters. What is integrative education? Throughout time, uh, educators have tried to solve the question or the mystery of how we learn. And what's happened is throughout the years there have been different solutions that have emerged. These different solutions have been put together as different pictures or different philosophies of learning. And what's happened is that over the last 60 years there have been different pictures. And these different pictures have, have been organized in such a way that you can be described as from A to Z on the spectrum of possibilities. What integrative education is about is bringing together the best or distilling the best principles of, of A and the best principles of Z and the best principles of M and L and bringing them together in one way that gets the best of what we've learned about learning together in one place and uses that to maximize our school setting. Does that suggest that people learn the same way today that they learned a hundred years ago? Well, I think what happens is we really haven't uh, understood completely how it is that people learn. And what's happening is that we are trying to penetrate that mystery, and this has been probably the most explosive time in the history of our research about how it is people learn. More has happened in the last 25 years than in the previous hundred. And yet the difficulty is that our school systems have not been able to catch up to what our best research tells us about the way in which we learn. And so we're facing an interesting challenge because this is a time that people in the culture are incredibly concerned about learning. We have it in the newspapers every day. There are reports that have come out from national commissions. The president has been concerned. We've seen discussions about corporations and their concern. And of course, there's all the testing issues that are up and standards. What's happened is that, is that given all that concern, um, how can we bring into our school system the best of what we know? How can we embody in our teachers the most important insights of the last 25 years? Unfortunately, the system is not set up to do that. Our teachers are trained at a particular point in time which don't... Uh, and and the, that training rarely encompasses the most recent research. It's been, they've been to school 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago and got what had been taught traditionally. And unfortunately, we're in a, in a time where that learning needs to occur if we're going to reach our maximum potential in, in the schools. When we talk about the history of education or the history of the process of learning, was it better in the old days? There wasn't, it seemed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the return to the three R's mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and the classics, sure. which aren't taught in the schools today the way they were then. Was it better? Well, that's a good question, because uh, let, me, let me draw an analogy for you. There was a, an anthropologist by the name of Wallace who was studying what happens in times of cultural transition. And what he was saying was that when there begin periods of change, two things begin to happen. Some people point to the future and say, I see the light, I see the new direction, there are the possibilities, let's go for it. Other people in periods of intense change go, we need to go back to the fundamentals, let's go back to the basics, let's go back to the three R's. And what we have is a split where one philosophy is pointing to the future and one philosophy is pointing to the past. What Wallace has said is that for a brief period of time, the people who point to the past in effect win out. They get a very strong voice, people listen to them, everybody talks about traditionalism and values and going back to the old way. But the truth of it is we can never return to the past. What eventually wins out in the cultural awakening is the future. So the question becomes how do we begin to see that that call to go backwards, that call to go into what we used to do, that supposedly was the good old days, is not really the call of our highest self. It's the call of a return to some place that's safe or theoretically safe. It never is the call to that light in the future. And what happens in all cultures and what happens in all systems is that we go on. A Abraham Maslow, who was a very famous psychologist in the 50s and 60s in, in this country, said that um, he said something very lovely. He said, one, and one of the things I like most about psychology, he says that one of the things I can depend upon is that every 10 years, the most cherished laws of psychology will come tumbling around, down around my ears. So that he knew that that which we knew in the past is going to be transcended. And in fact, when you look at education, when you think about our children, what are we doing with them? We're asking them in our schools to be able to do three things. One, we're asking them to absorb 
our cultural heritage, the past, what we know about jobs and roles and history and learning and music. Two, we're asking them to become citizens in our culture so that they can participate as free members of a democratic society. We want them to know how to choose and how to act and how to uh, make the best possible considered choices when all the things that happen. But third, we're asking them to transcend the past, to learn how to go beyond what we've done before. And what our school systems ought to be about, and in some cases are, are about training people to do those three things, to absorb our past, to prepare to participate in our culture, but really to be able to transcend the future so that we can get ready for the change that, that continues to happen. We see books all the time in our bookstores, in our, on our TV. We hear talk shows talking about the incredible rate of change that's happening in our, in our culture. And I know when I was a child, I remember my grandmother talking to me about how when she was born, nothing existed that we currently have. There was no television, no radio, no planes, no cars, no electricity, no men on the moon. None of the things that, no radio that we're talking on here, no media being distributed in this broad way. None of that stuff was here. In her lifetime, there's this phenomenal shift that occurred. Well, in, the life, in our lifetime and in the lifetime of our children, the rate of change is going to make that which we have here be dwarfed by that which is coming. How do we prepare our children to deal with that incredible shift that's going to inevitably come as technology advances in the study of human consciousness, cultural evolution take us on to the next stage? We must use our schools as, as settings to prepare children for whatever is to occur. It's not so important that they get concrete knowledge as that they get the knowledge for how to adjust to the change and the rate of change that's inevitably going to come. It gets faster all the time. You may have had the same experience I had when I was uh, in the bookstore. I was looking at a book that was said on the bookshelf. It said Future Shock. And I didn't have to read the book, and I knew exactly what they were talking about. There was that sense that somehow there was going to be some shock as a result of the rate at which the future was coming at us. And it's that that our schools need to be preparing children for, not just knowledge about the capital of France or about you know how mathematics works, but how to be able to prepare for the incredible shifts that are going to inevitably come as we master the various things that are at, at force in our culture. Because of the limited number of hours in a day and the, the limits that each student or each human being has within this educational process, does it mean that in order to spend the time that is necessary to prepare for the future and to prepare for the integration into the current society that the past the classics, mm -hmm. the basics, are always at fault. If, uh, not only the, the capital of France, the, the capital of uh, California in some instances, mm -hmm. the, the governor of California, they do little street tests all the time that have the most basic questions on them, and there are people that are working and living and functioning in today's society that really know very little of history mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, writing skills and reading skills continue to de deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the issue is not that we get, need to give up the information of the past. It's about the way we go about learning. In other words, um, if we just ask people to memorize things, when I went to college, I memorized all of these courses to take all of these exams, and a few months later, I remembered almost nothing of it. Though at some points, I could recognize a particular name or place if somebody went about uh, mentioning it to me. But the truth of it is it's how we go about learning and how we prepare our instrument, our human instrument, to be in relationship to knowledge as it comes to us, that's the critical thing. What are the, uh, we, so far we kind of talked in generalities, we've talked about the necessity for a change in approach in education. Mm -hmm. What are some of the foundations of, of that uh, direction, new direction? Mm -hmm. Well, the fundamental place to begin is with the mind-body split. There's a belief in our culture that our mind and our body are separate. And what happens is that that belief gets translated down through all our discussions and all our education. It's even shown in the way in which we separate PE from the classroom, as if what happens in our body in the classroom does not make a difference. We need to be able to get back to teach children how fundamentally our thoughts are actions. Our thoughts are our body in expression. When we think, in fact, in other words, if I were to say to you, think a particular thought such as, I am angry, if you just think that thought and concentrate on it, you will immediately experience shifts in your body. 
You may find your heart rate will change. You may find your muscles will tighten. Perhaps the frontalis muscle between your eyes will change. There is a fundamental relationship between what we think and how we experience our body. Consequently, we need to begin there. We need to let children know that kinesthetic learning, the learning of motion and movement, is fundamentally a part of our cognitive learning. They are not separate. And our emotional experience of the world is an experience of our body, not just of our mind. In other words, if I could say it differently, um, we need to recognize that our thoughts are actions and that how we think will determine how we experience our life. Charlie Garfield, uh, who's a uh, researcher who studied optimal performance and who's looked at the question of um, uh, cancer patients and how they change and heal, was doing research in the Olympics. He was, a, he was an Olympic weightlifter, and he was looking at how Russian athletes are able to transcend limits. And what he, what he discovered is that they concentrate internally on seeing the entire event as kinesthetically, sensorily, richly as possible. They visualize it, they think it through, they see it from beginning to end. And what he says is that when you think something through like that, your nervous system can't even tell whether it's you're actually going through it or whether in fact you have just thought it through. It processes it as if it's been an experience. So what the weight, Russian weightlifters do is they concentrate with affirmations and positive thinking and, 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 sensor, and sensory visualization to go through an entire event so that when they come to it and they have to actually make the lift, they've experienced in their body that they've already done it. So the learning changes, the, you know, their thinking process changes the way in which their body is able to function. In the past, in uh, traditional education, this has been somewhat discouraged as daydreaming. In, in basically, in most education, the body is put in park, and then you come and learn things cognitively. And unfortunately, uh, being in park doesn't serve one very well because we discover that if our body is in park, a mind eventually spaces out. I mean, if you um, let your body kind of fall asleep on you, eventually your mind falls asleep as well. So there needs to be a concentration on how to uh, create a state of alert, creative wakefulness, which involves really the mind and the body both being uh, in connection rather than some fundamental separation being uh, imposed or presented. What is the word education? Is there a, a significance to that, that that may help us in our struggle? Education comes from the Greek word educare, which means to draw forth from within. And it implies that somehow we know inside of ourselves what we need to have to work with. But the question is, how do we tap into that inner knowing? Mostly what happens in our schools is that we are told things from the outside and rarely given the skills for looking within. And so one of the challenges that our schools face is how to teach children to trust their own inner resources, their own inner knowing. How do they activate that ability to see inside themselves in a way that they can then translate and trust that knowledge? Frankly, what happens in most schools is that we don't teach children to trust themselves. We teach them to trust somebody who's telling them something. Yet what we know about learning is what makes learning work is novelty and the experience of discovery. What, what, when learning is to be retained, it's because people discover it, not because they're told it. Rote memorization only works for a brief period of time, yet the experience of literally discovering something for yourself really maximizes the degree to which you're able to hold on to something. And so the challenge is to be able to create for the students the experience of mystery, discovery, surprise, and novelty. When you've got that kind of thing happening, then people really integrate and hold on to in themselves the experience that they've gotten, and they're able to use that as a, as a building block for the next level of um, activity. So the challenge for us is how can we make our schools exciting? And what we really have them right now is being places for management. We manage the children rather than create the feeling of, oh, here is an incredible mystery. Let's go for it. There are some who would suggest that this the process of education should not take place in the school, that it really belongs at home, and that uh, uh, the school systems as they exist right now, as you suggested, are just for management, babysitting services, so parents can go away and do other things during that period. Um, what about that? What about education in the home? I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a situation of both rather than either or. And unfortunately, if you've been a parent who's grown up in our school system and have gotten the message that this is how learning is, you don't give very much to your children at home because you expect the school system to do it. The reality is that parents need to be educated on how to teach, and the school system needs to go through further learning and integration on how to teach. 
And with that kind of combined effort, the parents and the teachers together, we really have the possibility of going beyond what we've done before. If we don't have the parents working on issues of how to survive and how to learn and how to change and how to be a strong individual, I mean, it's not going to be the school systems who are going to be our saviors. In fact, if anything, they can only magnify um, some of the issues that the, that the children have had um, raised or not raised for them in their, in their personal environment. So I think we have a, a situation where both parents and teachers need to be skilled in the best of how we learn. But for our parents to do it, they have to go through it in, in, you know, in schools and in their own process of being raised. And what our schools can do is make real inroads to our future. If your children, as they're being raised, learn about ways to help themselves, help others, go inside themselves to trust their own resources, when they get to being parents, they will remember that. If they don't do that, then what will happen is they will be able to offer lo nothing more to their children than they were offered in schools or by their parents. When does education begin and when does it end? Um, there are, I remember watching a documentary of, about uh, infants that were barely old enough to sit up, uh, six, seven months old, and the parents were showing them flashcards with 432 times 3,627 mm -hmm. and uh, the answer uh, underneath and and showing these things and the, the mm -hmm. suggestion was that this was all going to be implanted and mm -hmm. they would know all the multiplication tables many times over mm -hmm. because they had started so mm -hmm. young. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, learning begins immediately and ends at the, at the end of life. It is not a, uh, it's not a time-limited activity. However, the question that you're raising is really a good one in a different way, which is what, I mean, people always ask the question, what comes first, mind or emotions? And there's a lot of research being done these days which argue against the way that kind of training that you just described is going. What it suggests is that for us to be cognitively strong, we need to build a clear emotional base first. Now, that's not just about affective education in the way that it was presented in the 60s. That's something much greater than that. It literally is saying that the way the brain works is that it organizes the world first by what are called feeling tones or emotional nuances. And this, and this is a theory that's presented basically by William Gray and Paul LaViolette. Gray is a psychiatrist, LaViolette is a systems and brain theorist. And what they show is that for you to be able to absorb and retain complex information, what you first need to have is an emotional base in which it's built on because that is the place, the way the brain stores things is by emotional nuances or tones. So if you want to find a particular bit of information, it is stored um, in a little category that has to do with a, an emotional feeling tone associated with it. So let me give you a concrete example rather than make it so abstract. If you were to memorize the phone book, you can't retain that very long. But if you were to memorize some fairly complex information, but tie each one of those things to some emotional coding, a particular feeling, your likelihood of recall is much greater. So what it's saying is that probably what's happening in that situation with those children is they are probably getting the feeling tone from parents of approval, of being stroked, of being loved, of being liked, of being um, told they're wonderful, uh, you know, all of these positive feeling spaces, and that's what allows them to retain that knowledge rather than the flashcards per se. In other words, if you're going to create a learning base, you probably need to create it on top of a strong emotional tone, which the child can then retain that learning base with. What's, what's problematic in our schools is that the material is treated as if it's rote information having nothing to do with the relationship between student and teacher. In fact, it's the tone of the classroom and when, what it felt like when we were learning that material that allows us to recall it. So, for example, for me, when I went to college, I took a whole series of graduate, uh, undergraduate survey courses like geology, sociology, psychology, etc. down the line. When I look back at my memory, the only one of those courses I recall was by a teacher whose emotional feeling state in that classroom was so rich, the humor was so great, the sense of relationship so keen, that I remember things he told us because they were learned in relationship to certain kinds of emotional states that can evoke that. Now, the way we have complementary knowledge or, or studies on that is that we've discovered that you can recall feeling states, knowledge associated with feeling states. For example, Let's say um, you watched a Woody Allen movie, and what happened was with that particular feeling state, you, um, you had a smile, a big smile. What happens is you can recall certain things about that activity, the, the movie itself, in more detail when you bring up that smile or that feeling space than when you are just trying to remember the movie without remembering the emotional tone. 
So somehow there's a fundamental connection between emotions and thinking, which basically our schools don't recognize at this point, and which have to be addressed if we're going to maximize our learning base. One of the real controversies in education is the question of who who are the teachers of today and who should be the teachers of tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, somewhere, and I'll probably get a nasty letter over this one, but somewhere I saw some research that was done that suggested that the the majority of the people that were teaching in the public school systems were from the lower 25 percent of graduating classes and the and the, the statistics are probably way off but the gist of the research w suggested that people who uh, had potential for higher earnings were going into all other sorts of fields law and medicine and and were becoming engineers and uh, computer scientists and so on and that the 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 mass of teachers were coming from the leftovers from our institutions of higher learning. Um, that's probably a terrible mass indictment, and I'm sure there's some wonderfully uh, bright people that are out there teaching right now that I don't want them to be mad at me, but in the criticism of education, one of the criticisms is that some of the people that are doing the job right now really aren't, aren't uh, too well qualified to do it. I think what you're res responding to is the fact that our economic system supports those people who are best and our brightest to theoretically go after the money. And they may do so in engineering, business, or other areas. I think the key thing with teachers is that whoever, t whoever our teachers are, at whatever level of prior background and whatever percent of the, you know, the um, zero to a hundred, you know, uh, spectrum of greatness they might have, the teachers have to be one thing. They have to be models. They have to embody the quality of learning that we want our students to get. The teachers who think they teach but are not, are not students as well are not good teachers. Um, children watch what we do, so we need to watch, we need to watch what we do. We need to see um, that it's how we act that the children imitate. If we look like we're not interested in learning, the children will not be interested in learning. When we are excited about learning, the children get excited about learning. So the critical issue is finding teachers who will model their own excitement, their own enthusiasm, their own feeling for the material as being rich and alive. The teachers who are doing it on rote, because they did it last year in that way, are going to give the message to the children, get by. I mean, I have three daughters in three different levels of school, in elementary school, in junior high school, and in high school. And I watch with each passing year, how, as my daughters get older, they perceive their teachers as less interested. And they consequently get less interested. They see it as more a game of getting by than the real mystery of learning. And yet when I take them into my own private learning process with them, I see them get incredibly turned on and excited because they see me in the middle of my learning process, me willing to be vulnerable. And the school systems, because they've so much emphasized standards, behavioral objectives, outcomes, all those kinds of things, which are important, but they get confused and substituted in place of the excitement for learning so that you just get concerned with outcome rather than the process of learning. We have to have teachers who are concerned with both the process of how we learn as well as the outcome that we have. That's who we need as teachers for the future. What role might computers play in the, role, in the process of education? Well, we have an explosion happening, and we have, have not yet figured how to master that explosion. The truth of it is that, as I see it, we are looking at a situation where we have got to integrate the relationship between human consciousness and computers and maximize our utilization of computers for places where we need that style of learning and yet keep the question of individual choice and individual consciousness in the places where we need discretionary learning. If we are to deal with the future, I think our computers are going to be m tremendously helpful in helping us make sense of learning that needs to be knowledge-based. They will save us uh, a tremendous amount of material that we don't have to worry about. Yet our computers can't make our ethical choices for us. It can't deal with our morality in that way. We need to be looking at that and have the human capacity for discretion in those areas. What our computers can do is can assist us in the learning that we have in a knowledge base. What we need our schools to do is to facilitate our moral development, our understanding of dealing with uncertainty, our capacity to, to deal with whatever emerges in our future. Because we are going to have some choices that have to do with the survival of this planet, with the integrity of human beings, with the question of, questions of genetic um, evolution that are going to be staggering relative to the kinds of things we're dealing with now. And if we have not prepared our children to choose wisely, the consequences will be for our culture and our planet as a whole. Isn't there a movement today in education, uh, 
not from educators necessarily, but from the society and, and the political structure to keep morality and those sorts of things, the, the issue of prayer in schools and all the rest, to keep the, the to keep the emotions out of the classroom, to keep emotions out of school, to not let teachers express who they are and what they're all about and what their belief patterns are, but simply to just give them material. Mm -hmm. I think that probably would be an accurate statement. Uh, there's an attempt to suggest that teaching is simply a technology rather than art and a relationship. Uh, when I speak about learning about morality, I don't mean learning what's the right idea, but how does one ethically decide about things? What are the templates that you bring to look at a decision? And there are tremendous studies done by uh, Jean Piaget, a Swiss psychologist, and by Lawrence Kohlberg, a Harvard psychologist, which look at the question of moral development, not at the level of this is what you should believe, but this is how at different stages we go through uh, understanding the complexity of, of moral choices. And what's clear is that our culture has not helped children learn that. We've learned that on, in effect, through street psychology. We've seen what's right and what's wrong intuitively. And yet there's great things to be learned about when you act for the good of the whole versus when you act for your own good. And what are the differences there? And to raise the question of ethical decision-making in our schools, particularly as we go through the changes that happen when we get to elementary school where it's very concrete, into high school where it begins to look very abstract, is a very important part of our teenagers being, becoming capable of taking our place as citizens in our culture. How can we expect them to make political choices if they don't understand the way in which moral choices are made, since politics eventually become a choice of values and morals? Can individuals teach the process of learning to make moral and ethical decisions if they don't exhibit their own decisions in, in any way, shape, or form? Can you be uh, so-called totally objective in your approach and still get the message across if you're not excited about what it is that you yeah. believe. I think the truth of it is that the notion of objectivity that we had in science for so long is absolutely dead. We are going to hang on to it for as long as we possibly can to think that there's an objective world out there, but everything about our science of the last 25 years suggests that there is no more objective world, that when we watch we change the world, that we are part of the world, that we can never separate ourselves from it. So the truth of it is a teacher can't be purely objective in that way, but they can call where their bias is. In other words, if you can reveal where you're coming from, you don't get, you're not stuck in the same way as if you say, well, this is just clean and objective, but the truth of it is you have a bias. If you call your bias, people can say, oh, he's coming from there. I don't have to wonder where he's coming from, and I don't have to take that as the truth. They are acknowledging their point of view. The challenge for teachers is to always acknowledge their point of view, whether those teachers be in public schools, whether they be politicians, whether they be gurus and, gurus and ashrams, they need to acknowledge their point of view. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening. <laughs>